Welcome back. It's day 16 to 365 where we study and read the Bible together. And today we're reading from Genesis 49. And today's a good day, y'all, because we finally getting out of Genesis and we're starting Exodus um, today as well. But before we get started, y'all already know what to do. Go ahead and hit the like button so the word of God can spread to more people. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we ask that you just bless your word. We ask that we have open hearts so that we may receive it. And we ask that the word just come alive for us today, God. We ask that you just have your way. You allow the Holy Spirit to come and dwell with each one of us as we're reading and listening to the Bible on today. God, we ask that you remove all distraction and allow us to focus on this divine appointment with you. We love you and we appreciate you. And we're so thankful for another day to get to know more about you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In chapter 49, Jacob is on his deathbed, but before he draws his last breath, he is blessing and prophesying to his 12 sons, which later become the 12 tribes of Israel. Each blessing reflected each son's character and future destiny. And Jacob called his sons. Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey, lying down between two burdens, he saw that rest was good, and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden, and became a band of slaves. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Joseph is a fruitful bough a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong 
by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Then he charged them. I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. In chapter 50, Jacob is now dead and his sons are taking him up from Egypt to bury him with his fathers. Joseph's life also comes to an end, but not before reassuring his brothers. <laughs> then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. Now when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh. If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying. In my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, please, let me go up and bury my father and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bear your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning of the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, 
and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephraim, the Hittite, as property for a burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph. Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Here we see that Joseph's brothers are still scared and remorseful for what they did when they were young. And we can see in verse 20 that Joseph has fully submitted and surrendered his life to God. He understands that God has a plan that's better than one that he has for himself. And he is fully okay with everything that has happened to him because he knows that it hasn't just happened to him, but it's happened for him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. Behold, we are your servants. Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham. To Isaac and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel. God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Y'all already know what time it is. I got my notes here and today I'm going to be doing my chapter summary on chapter 50. Verse 50 and 20 is something that we must all remember as we go through life. Just as Joseph has realized this, we must also realize it for ourselves. What the enemy meant for evil against you, God meant for good. To release all the pain, the grudges, and everything else you've been holding on to because God has a greater purpose for your pain. We must be willing to forgive those who have trespassed against us so that God may be willing to forgive us for our own trespasses. And what we have to remember when we're going through our Joseph season is that God is going to use your pain and allow it to lead you towards your purpose. In Exodus chapter 1, there is now a new king of Egypt or a new pharaoh, and he doesn't know Joseph, which means he has no connection. He has no alliance with the Israelites. To add some background information, God actually prophesies the oppression and slavery of the Israelites to Abram in Genesis 15 and 13, when he said, knowing certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. The Book of Exodus 
Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were seventy persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. It's clear to see that the king of Egypt is threatened and fearful of the numerous amounts and the multitude of the Israelites that are there. But it's something that he's going to have to just deal with because this is something that God has prophesied and has a covenant with their lineage. And the Bible says the more Egypt afflicted and oppressed the Israelites, the more they multiplied. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. And evidently this angered the king, and so he's tasked the midwives with killing all the newborn sons. But it's something about that godly fear. And we see here that to fear God is truly to honor God and to be obedient to the Lord, and he will bless you for it. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. But that's all for day 16, and I really appreciate you being a part of it. And so if this was a blessing to you, go ahead and share this with three other people who need to hear this too. And I'll see you on day 17. Peace.